This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. We were waiting on uh, Dr. Mike Halkos, who is going to introduce our speaker. Uh, but I will go ahead and uh, introduce since we're uh, past 7.30. Uh, it is our pleasure today uh, to introduce Dr. Morali Dhar Padala, who has presented at this Grand Rounds a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Padala is an Associate Professor in Cardiothoracic Surgery here in the Department of Surgery and Director of the Cardiothoracic Research Lab at uh, uh, Emory's um, Carlisle Fraser Heart Center at Midtown. He also has an adjunct uh, faculty position at Georgia Tech. Uh, he is going to talk to us today about not new approaches to treating mitral regurgitation. Dr. Padala. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come back here again. I present here the research that is going on in my laboratory every few years. And some of you do remember what I present. So it's actually good to show progress and that we are actually progressing uh, on several of the uh, projects. Uh, these are my disclosures. So my laboratory and my career have been primarily focused on the mitral valve. I've been quite fascinated by its structure and uh, it is because it is a beautiful structure that has a fascinating uh, function. It is a dynamic structure that is attached at the annular level to a dynamic mitral annulus. And to the in the ventricle, it is attached to two papillary muscles, which move along with the myocardium, but also do contract and act like shock absorbers for the uh, valve leaflets. Even though this is uh, written in literature as a bileaflet valve, there is nothing really common between the two leaflets, the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet, which are two leaflets that form this valve are quite different from one another, but both of which are connected by chordate tendinate to the papillary muscles in the left uh, ventricle. If we look closely at each of these valve leaflets, the anterior leaflet is somewhat like a dome shaped uh, structure, which is quite long has cords largely at the edge of the leaflet or just in the rough zone of the leaflet, but not in the other regions of the valve uh, of the leaflet. And it moves quite more than the posterior leaflet. So when you look at the anterior leaflet, in diastole from its closed state to its open state, it moves a lot. And from in systole from its open state to its fully closed state, it moves quite a bit as well. But that is not the case with the posterior leaflet. The posterior leaflet, in contrast, has multiple cords that are inserting into the entire body of the posterior leaflet, which is cut here and shown on both sides. It is a very short radial leaflet that is crescentic shape. It is quite adjacent to the mitral annulus, so any changes in the mitral annular motion tend to typically impact this valve leaflet as well. And if you look closely at the mitral valve motion, there is very little motion of the posterior leaflet in diastole and systole uh, during the cardiac cycle. If we look at each of these leaflets, the real functional part of the valve, which is to form a seal, really occurs only at the edge of the leaflet, where the cord is insert. So you can separate the leaflets into the smooth zone and the rough zone. The smooth zone is what has minimal caudal insertions, has much stiffer tissue, and literally acts just like a lid that closes the valve leaflet. But the real overlap or coaptation between the leaflets really occurs along the rim of the leaflet, where these different cordae insert, and the tissue that extends from this reach insertion, which is a strut caudal insertion, to the marginal caudal insertion, is what forms this very nice coaptation shelf. Now, what forms that coaptation shelf? Actually, it's quite, uh, the coaptation shelf formation is written into the structure of the mitral valve. So when a valve leaflet is open in diastole and moves into systole, there is a certain amount of verticalization of the leaflet that occurs, which forms the coaptation shelf. And that verticalization of the leaflet occurs primarily because the marginal cordae, which are these thin cordae, are not very extensible, so they cannot let the edge of the leaflet move all the way close to the mitral annulus. 
Whereas these cords, which insert into the belly of the leaflet, are a lot more extensible and help with doming of this entire uh, leaflet surface. So when there is doming in one region, but the leaflet edge cannot move all the way up to the annulus, there is a certain amount of verticalization, which occurs with both the leaflets, and that is what forms the nice coaptation shelf. And this coaptation shelf is necessary and is typically between eight millimeters to a centimeter in a normal valve because the mitral valve sees a very high transvalvular gradient. A valve as complicated as this requires multiple of its components to work together. And the risk of one or more of these components failing resulting in valvular regurgitation is quite high which is the reason that as uh, if you look at the uh, pre prevalence of valvular heart disease, mitral regurgitation re occurrence rates are quite high and tend to increase with age. If you look at mitral regurgitation, it can be primarily classified into two forms, primary mitral regurgitation and secondary or functional mitral regurgitation. In primary mitral regurgitation, the valve leakage is primarily from structural or degenerative defects of the mitral valve, which is typically mitral valve prolapse of some form, Barlow's type of pathology, or few other structural uh, degenerative pathologies of the valve itself. Whereas in, the, in primary MR, the origin of the regurgitation is because of this valve defect. Whereas in secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, the regurgitation is through the valve, but the regurgitation typically develops secondary to left ventricular or left atrial dysfunction or dilatation, which perturbs the normal geometry of the valve and its mechanics, which restricts closure of the valve and systole, causing this regurgitation. Both forms of uh, regurgitation typically tend to have an adverse impact on cardiac function. So these graphs show uh, the natural history of primary mitral regurgitation, where we do see on the x-axis the years after diagnosis, on, on the y-axis we see events. What we do see is that as the patient progresses over time with mitral regurgitation, they tend to worsen in their cardiac function with the number of cardiovascular events increasing and also the morbidity and mortality increasing as well. Same is the case with secondary mitral regurgitation too, whether the underlying pathology is ischemic cardiomyopathy or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, where you do see that patients typically tend to do worse with regurgitation when it is combined with the cardi cardiomyopathic processes in the ventricular tissue. So my laboratory has been primarily interested in trying to treat MR, number one, in better ways than what are available today. And secondly, we are interested in trying to understand what is the optimal timing of intervention. Because currently, most of the timing of intervention typically seems to occur based on symptoms. And in animal models that we have developed, symptoms typically tend to occur late after the onset of what the substrate remodeling has already occurred. So sometimes even, in, even targeting that mitral regurgitation does not really reverse that substrate remodeling that has already occurred. So today I'm going to share with you some of our ongoing projects on a variety of things in primary mitral regurgitation and secondary mitral regurgitation. So in primary mitral regurgitation, this is one of those mitral valve lesions, which is actually very, very amenable to surgical repair. Surgeons do a phenomenally good job at it. And this is from one of the most experienced surgeons in the world, Tyrone David at University of Toronto, where he has shown that if he repairs a mitral valve prolapse and the ventricle isn't as bad, he typically tends to get quite good survival at 20 years after the repair and with a very uh, low incidence of reoperative rates. Most surgeons use these three techniques, either it is a non-resective technique called neocordoplasty, where the broken cords or the prolapsing leaflet is repaired by implanting EPTFE cordae onto these valves to bring down the leaflets and get them into coaptation. Whereas the other techniques, which are called the Carpentier techniques, are to cut and resect specific diseased parts of the mitral valve, reshape them and tailor them together so that you get a competent valve. 
even though the outcomes in the real world uh, in experience centers are really good, literature is abundant with multiple failures of these uh, approaches. For example, this is a case where a patient received a repair of their uh, prolapsing valve, but within a short period of time, there, there was progressive degeneration of the disease, which led to new leaflet prolapse and caudal rupture. This is a case where uh, a patient received repair of their posterior P2 cusp prolapse with an annuloplasty ring that was downsized quite a bit to so-called reinforce the repair. And the patient came back with very high gradients across the valve leaflets, resulting in regurgitation, uh, resulting in mitral stenosis. Here's another patient uh, where residual regurgitation was seen, right, coming out of the operating room when neocordae were performed. And this was not seen at the time of coming off pump, but right after coming out of the operating room, you could see regurgitation. So there are umpteen, I'll skip some of these, but there are umpteen number of cases where you actually do see failure of these mitral valve repairs. And there are, publications which actually show that in the real world, the durability of mitral valve repair, when you consider all centers, if not centers of expertise, is uh, not as good as it should be when repairing these valves. Most of these repair failures typically tend to relate back to the biomechanics of the repair. The reason is that you're taking this valve, which has very degenerated tissue, and you are reshaping, restructuring, and reconstructing it, and putting it into a hemodynamic environment, which would impose biomechanical stresses on it, which would ultimately lead to either disease progression or potentially could lead to failure as well. So one of the very early projects that we had done, uh, this is work with uh, my postdoctoral fellow, Gediminas Gaidulis, is to see how do all of these different repair techniques impact the biomechanics of the valve. So what we have done is taken 3D ultrasound images from patients who are under, who come in with uh, mitral valve prolapse and then use segmentation techniques to develop the 3D geometry of these valves and use physics-based modeling to actually understand how do these valves work when we simulate a variety of surgical techniques on them. So what you're looking at here is the clinical workflow or the workflow we use in our computational model where we develop this dynamic mitral valve prolapse uh, model from a patient-specific 3D ultrasound. And then we perform a variety of the surgical techniques that we have already uh, introduced to you. One of the first techniques we tried is a triangular resection, where we are removing a triangular segment of the tissue from the prolapsing segment and suturing it together. The second is a quadrangular resection, where we remove a much larger section of the tissue and sutured the whole thing together to create a new uh, non-regurgitant and prolapsing valve. And similarly, we also performed implantation of multiple neocordae onto the valve leaflets so that we can actually restrain these uh, prolapsing segments and keep them from uh, averting back into the left atrium. And in all of these different techniques, we also implanted a variety of sizes of annuloplasty rings to actually understand whether the combination of a ring with these different techniques has any beneficial effect on the biomechanics of the valve. What we found from these uh, variety of simulation studies that we performed is that most of the time when you want to restore coaptation, and this is more relevant to the surgeons, when you want to restore coaptation, it is better not to resect tissue and remove it from the prolapsing segments, but actually use uh, these replacement neocordae which do a better job at achieving a coaptation surface, which is quite large and physiological, which is what we see here. The blue area is the coaptation surface that is restored with neocordoplasty compared to a much reduced coaptation surface that you get with triangular resection and quadrangular resection. What this tells us is if any of these techniques are done on patients today, which they are done today on a daily basis, you do get a valve that doesn't leak but the underlying biomechanics are completely different irrespective of getting the same result, which is a competent valve. These are the stresses that we see on the valve leaflets. What we actually see is that when we place neocordae, in this case, we placed it on the posterior leaflet, uh, 
we do get uh, stresses that are actually reduced than what they were in the mitral valve prolapse uh, disease case. But that is not the case when we perform triangular resection or quadrangular resection, where we actually see that when we do these resective techniques, you can increase the stresses not only on the valve leaflet that you have repaired, but on the opposing leaflet as well, because when these resective techniques are done, the, the leaflet that has been repaired doesn't move as much, and the opposing leaflet really has to move a lot more to come into coaptation. We show that even caudal forces typically tend to do worse when you do these resective techniques versus uh, placing neocordoplasty, uh, neocordae into these valves. This biomechanical study was complicated, but what it actually showed us is that the getting a competent valve in surgery doesn't always equate to a good biomechanically optimal and durable repair. So what we started thinking about is how can we make mitral valve repair easy? One of the biggest challenges when neocordoplasty is performed in patients is that you are placing a suture onto the leaflets you're taking it and tacking it down in the papillary muscles or in the reverse where you tack it down in the papillary and bring it up to the leaflets. There's just no way to optimally size them because you're doing that under a saline test while the heart is arrested, <clears throat> which works okay. But then once you come off pump, you start to see that they actually don't work well enough. So we started with a simple modification. As I go through the talk, I will talk about more complicated innovation, but the simplest thing that we did is why do we actually need to put the suture in the ventricle? Why can't we just put it through the leaflet and pull it up through the annulus and use a simple tourniquet after coming off pump to adjust the, uh, that leaflet uh, tension or leaflet folding such that we can get a good result. We did that in a bench model where here you see a flailing uh, posterior leaflet. And once we placed a simple suture, pulled it through the annulus and attached it to a tourniquet and adjusted it, what we were able to do is completely get the coaptation back in a very simple and nice way. So this technique simplifies a lot of the repair that gets complicated by trying to place cords in a very complicated manner in the left ventricle. So this gave us motivation to try to see whether we can actually develop a percutaneous device, which can be used in a transeptal approach to correct mitral valve regurgitation in the setting of P2 prolapse primarily. So this is work that I'm currently working on with uh, Stephanie Tom, who is a general surgery resident working in the lab and Julia Toma, who is an undergrad from Georgia Tech working in the lab as well. And our concept is rather simple. There's a P2 leaflet, which is prolapsing, if you put a neo leaflet on top of it, which is made of EPTFE that encapsulates that uh, prolapsing segment, we should be just fine. So that is the concept that we had started building upon. So here's a P2 prolapse where we cut the cords in a, in a pig model and we created very big P2 prolapse. And what we did is simply engulf the entire P2 with an EPTFE or a pericardial patch that goes around the edge of the leaflet and is pulled through the annulus. So what it does is, this is a video where you can see very nice prolapse of the leaflet. And this is the same neo leaflet now without any flail or prolapse of the segment, but a very nice neo leaflet that moves along with the leaflet. And this device with some preliminary data now has shown that we are able to consistently correct the regurgitation but obviously the optimal tensioning on this and making sure that this neo leaflet doesn't actually retract the entire leaflet uh, is something that we are still working on. So in regards to this, uh, we are in early stages of development where we are trying to deploy this neo leaflet through the uh, mitral valve annulus through via transeptal approach. And a wide neo leaflet seems to be able to actually correct and uh, correct mitral valve prolapse quite well in these valves. And it removes the need for precision because one of the challenges that we are seeing today with a variety of technologies that are coming up are that these technologies are trying to grasp the leaflet, attach a cord, pull the cord down into the ventricle, anchor it into the ventricle. Most of the time, one or the other keeps pulling out. 
So by taking this approach of folding an entire neoleaflet around the prolapsing leaflet, we think that we can uh, re remove that uh, need for precision and also the different tugging forces that impact the uh, long-term efficacy of these uh, approaches. So that's one of our first projects which we are working on right now in terms of uh, primary MR. As we started working on developing devices that would uh, help us really correct mitral valve prolapse, one of the questions that always keeps coming up is, when do you really intervene in primary MR? Most of the patients do not get referred for any intervention of their mitral valve prolapse until you actually do uh, see symptoms in them. What about the asymptomatic patients? There is quite a bit of data now that even asymptomatic patients, when they get repair of their mitral valve prolapse, tend to do much better than when they do not get repair. So how do we actually identify those patients? We don't know. So we went to the laboratory and created a simple uh, long-term chronic PMR model in uh, small animals because uh, large animals gone for six months to one year just gets too expensive. So we thought we'll, we should study the hearts in these animals that have been introduced with primary mitral regurgitation. So what we have done is a very simple technique. In a beating heart uh, of a rat, we put a eight French ice probe down the esophagus and convert it into a transesophageal probe. And with that direct imaging, we place a purse string on the left ventricular apex and put a needle through the uh, apex into the mitral valve and create a hole that creates mitral regurgitation. And then we survive these rats for, we have done that close to a year now and looked at how their ventricles act, actually progress over time. This is a model that uh, one of my research uh, scientists, Dr. Daisuke Onohara, had developed in the laboratory. And this is something that we have uh, used quite a bit. I'll skip the video here, but uh, basically what you do get is this. This is a baseline echo of a mitral valve with flow going from the left atrium into the left ventricle in diastole. And this is in systole where you see severe mitral regurgitation through this valve because we have now poked the hole. We confirm with uh, ultrasound in these rats how the regurgitation looks like. We quantify the MR jet area, we quantify the MR volume, but we also look for pulmonary flow reversal and demonstrate that at two weeks, we look at every single rat and demonstrate that there is severe mitral regurgitation. So hemodynamically, it mimics a patient who would have had mitral valve prolapse with this amount of regurgitation. We then follow these animals. Currently, we have data till up to 40 weeks. And what this data shows is what you see in patients. Ejection fraction is largely preserved. So the red is with MR and black is with age and uh, weight matched controls. You can see that initially after the induction of MR, there is a slight rise in EF, which is expected, but there isn't really that much of a fall in ejection fraction, despite that amount of severity of mitral regurgitation. However, the end diastolic volume or the LV volume continues to increase from get go and never really halts or stops during the entire uh, survival period. And so is there an increase in end systolic volume as well. So, when patients come, come in and they have preserved ejection fraction, they do not have any symptoms despite their MR, but their LV is growing in size. Do you actually refer those patients for repair? So that's the question we started with. And what we wanted to get to is, if we remove EF from the equation, can we find an index which actually tells us if the left ventricular tissue is remodeling or not? So what we have done is, well, if you take a heart and the heart is enlarging over time, what is happening simply is that each of these cardiomyocytes are being stretched out and becoming longer and thinner, or the extracellular matrix is increasing and being stretched and becomes fibrotic as well. So what we have done in these rats is, we started with the hypothesis that since the heart is remodeling, is the stiffness of the myocardium changing as well? Can we use that as a better predictor of understanding left ventricular remodeling process? So what we have done is we have taken rat hearts out of these model over multiple uh, time points. We took the tissue, we did biaxial mechanical testing to actually get the stiffness of this myocardium. 
Then we did some decellularization, removed cells out of this so that we only have extracellular matrix and then did biaxial mechanical testing as well. And what we found is uh, something interesting. What we found is that just the intact tissue, leaving the decellularized part alone, the stiffness of the myocardium continues to rise as the ventricle continues to age with primary mitral regurgitation, even if your EF is preserved. So what that is what is shown here is that the elastic modulus and the end systolic volume, they have a nice correlation in terms of increase with, oh, uh, with time as we survive with primary mitral regurgitation. So what we wanted to do then is, is there a non-invasive way of actually trying to identify or calculate our myocardial stiffness. So we have started now working with Stas Emelianov at Georgia Tech on a probe, which can actually do non-invasive elastography on the heart, such that we can actually get some of the myocardial stiffness measurements on, this, uh, on these hearts. So elastography is actually used in uh, assessing breast tumors and looking at a variety of liver diseases as well, but it has never been applied to the heart. And the reason for that is the heart moves. So trying to focus anything down is really tough. So what we have done now is we have developed this long probe, which can actually, which has all these electronics at the tip of it. So we are actually just getting to the myocardium, like you're doing a right heart cath type of an approach, getting to the myocardium. It imposes the shear waves just from the tip of that catheter and it looks at the changes in the velocities to estimate the stiffness. This is in a very early stage prototype right now. We haven't really done some of that uh, development to actually get to the clinic yet. But there is some emerging work that has come out from uh, Soren Pislaru's lab at uh, Mayo Clinic where they have actually shown and used this in patients that you can do non-invasive estimation of myocardial stiffness without anything too complicated, but just looking at wave propagation in the myocardium using simple tissue Doppler methods. And they've actually reported in patients that even though when you have a mitral regurgitation patient who is highly asymptomatic, you can use these techniques to assess their stiffness and their stiffness increase is related to their outcomes after they get a mitral valve repair. So we are kind of going along these same paths, but coming up with a better uh, or a direct measurement uh, of the myocardial stiffness. I'll switch gears a little bit. So primary mitral regurgitation is something that we got into not too long ago and started getting some work done. But secondary and functional mitral regurgitation is where I have done quite a bit of work and uh, previously have reported that as well. The reason I find secondary or functional mitral regurgitation quite fascinating for innovation is because you have the sick ventricle that is failing, and then you've got an overlay of functional mitral regurgitation on top of it. When you correct the valve, do you save the ventricle? When you correct the valve, do you also correct the ventricle? Does correcting the valve even do anything to the ventricle? These questions have existed for a very long period of time. There is no real direct answer to it, but there is data emerging in that regard. And there is a huge clinical gap in patients surviving with heart failure where neither medical therapy nor CRT nor any of these different uh, early stage heart failure technologies have worked. And there are patients who currently do not have any therapy available to them. When you look at these patients, we started looking at, well, if you have these heart failure patients with functional mitral regurgitation, who should you even correct regurgitation in to get a benefit? When you look at the spectrum of these patients, their regurgitation grades often do not entirely match up with their left ventricular dysfunction or left ventricular volumes. So what you typically see is a spectrum where you have small ventricles with regurgitation, but you also have very large ventricles with uh, functional mitral regurgitation. Our hypothesis was, which is what uh, we started with a long time ago, but the COAP trial pretty much confirmed, is that when you have severe MR that is imposing a volume overload on the left ventricle, but the left ventricular volume by itself is not very large, then correcting the FMR tends to benefit the ventricle. 
which makes complete physiological sense because you are removing a volume overload, you're reducing the wall stresses from the FMR alone. But since the ventricle is small, the inherent shape and size of the left ventricle doesn't actually elevate the wall stresses. So the contribution of the ventricle itself to that remodeling may not be that much. Whereas when you go to the other extreme, which is large ventricles with FMR, you have two factors playing in there, the volume overload from the mitral regurgitation, but also the ventricular wall stresses from how the shape and sphericity of the ventricle are. So I'll skip the surgical side of things for a short while so that I can get to the more interesting percutaneous stuff. The surgeons have done these trials, which I was going to discuss, but probably we don't need to because those were all negative trials. What they pretty much showed in their trials are two things. Firstly, that when you have patients who have ischemic heart disease requiring cabbage and have mitral regurgitation, correcting that mitral regurgitation really doesn't do anything to those ventricles. And this was done in a randomized fashion, which is quite contradictory to what independent centers have reported over the past several decades, that correcting MR, typically moderate MR, doesn't really benefit these patients. The second thing that the surgical trials have shown is that surgical repair is inferior to replacement. So they all started replacing the valves now. But the interventional cardiology field went exactly the opposite way, which is the advent of MitraClip and Pascal devices, which are transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair devices. They have started repairing these valves with functional mitral regurgitation and they've actually shown mortality benefit and reduction in heart failure hospitalization rates as well with these two approaches. So this, these are two interventional devices that are currently available where the basic premise is if you have a valve that is leaking, especially in functional MR, you just go in, grasp the two leaflets and clip them together permanently, sometimes with one clip, but sometimes with more than one clip, up to three clips where you have them one beside another. So you're permanently approximating the leaflets together in systole and eliminating the regurgitation. But however, this does create a diastolic problem as you would expect that you're, you're potentially creating mitral stenosis. However, from the COAP trial that compared guideline-directed medical therapy alone with guideline-directed medical therapy with FMR correction with the mitroclip, what was seen is that the all-cause mortality has been significantly reduced in these patients number one, which is what you see on the left side with FMR correction. But what is more interesting is that this trial actually allowed for patients to cross over between arms at two years. So the data is, this is actually quite fascinating because at two years, you actually see that patients who get FMR correction with guideline-directed medical therapy tend to have lower mortality compared to those with medical therapy alone. But when people cross over late in their disease progression, correcting the regurgitation didn't seem to benefit that much. So correct FMR in the right patients, maybe early, may yield a good amount of mortality benefit uh, in these uh, advanced heart failure patients. And they found the same uh, type of results even with heart failure hospitalization rates where the number of heart failure hospitalization rates with FMR correction was reduced quite a bit. Though everything is quite good with MitraClip uh, devices, there are some challenges in the real world because most of these trials which are industry funded are phenomenal, but they always have very good outcomes. When you go into real world, you typically can't replicate that. For example, this is one of the challenges you see. This is a patient from uh, one of our collaborators that we got where the patient came in with this type of a valve anatomy got a very had central regurgitation, got a mitroclip where the MR was complete, uh, corrected quite well. But then at three months, you can almost see that the valve has literally become stenotic. So several new concepts are starting to emerge as the number of patients getting mitroclips are increasing. Firstly, mitroclip and Pascal require a very favorable anatomy that would work. If not, you typically get out of the interventional uh, cath lab with quite a bit of remnant regurgitation. Some of the cardiologists that I've 
uh, spoken to, one of the things they say is that we are, when we go in and we put a stent, that's a very satisfying procedure because you are seeing flow being restored. When we go in and do a mitral clip, it's not a very satisfying procedure because we started with mitral regurgitation. Now we ended with mitral regurgitation and a clip. So uh, that is something that's starting to emerge in the field uh, even more. The second thing is that most of these valves are starting to become stenotic. Even intraprocedurally, you see gradients that go up to about four or five millimeters mercury. And when you put the first clip, there's certain MR correction, but there's still MR left. Do you go in with the second clip or are you going to create this mitral stenosis? This constant uh, so-called mind games that you have to go through in the cath lab aren't really that easy to discern. And they are starting to show in outcomes as well, where patients with these gradients are starting to do much worse than the patients that would not have these gradients. And lastly, this clipping of the valve leaflets together creates a end stage repair. You can't do anything beyond that. What you can do is you have to go and get surgically those clips removed because you can't do anything else in these patients if those clips fail. And there's a very recent article in Jack which showed that this operative mortality is somewhere in the 12.4% range in these patients who are getting their uh, clips removed. And these valves are never really repairable. They're all being replaced. So based on this uh, need that we have identified where if in patients who can benefit from FMR correction, CLIPS have done a phenomenal job of establishing the field of transeptal leaflet uh, repair, but we can do a better job with it. So what we came up with is going back to the physiology of the valve leaflet or the anatomy of the valve leaflet, which I mentioned before, is that the valves need a coaptation shelf to always coapt. If you give them a coaptation shelf and enable their coaptation, they do a good job. So we came up with this very simple approach where when you have regurgitation, you have a tiny gap between the leaflets. So we would enhance the leaflet or provide the leaflet with an artificial coaptation surface so that it corrects FMR itself. Where does this hypothesis come from? We started looking at heart failure patients. There are a lot of heart failure patients with very large ventricles, but not all of them have FMR. Some of them do, some of them don't. The, when we look at patients who don't have FMR, it's typically because their leaflets are longer. And when their leaflets are longer, which typically means that their leaflets are very well augmented. So we basically use that approach, came up with this clip-like device that you can clip onto the valve leaflet at the site of regurgitation, and that would eliminate the MR. So it's a very simple nitinol clip with a fabric, and that adds thickness or a bump to the edge of the leaflet. So here, the clinical workflow is identical to MitraClip, except that instead of grasping two leaflets and bringing them together, we are grasping one leaflet and releasing a tiny bump onto it, which is what you see here. And that's our repair. And it attaches really well. It really doesn't have, it doesn't impede motion of the valve native leaflets in themselves. So what we are doing is enabling the valve to correct its own problem by adding this tiny uh, space filler or uh, leaflet enhancer. This isn't a pick where we have done this transeptally. We put a guide across the septum, then we uh, insert the device through this guide down the mitral valve. With, we don't use fluoro as much anymore. This is completely under ultrasound guidance. We get down to the mitral valve, we grasp, either the anterior leaflet or the posterior leaflet. Then we release this uh, spacer onto the valve leaflet and uh, let that spacer pretty much do its job in correcting the FMR. So here we are still positioning and here I've grasped the anterior leaflet in this specific uh, pig. You can see the grasp of the anterior leaflet right there. Once we have grasped, we then pull these wires that attach the implant to the delivery catheter and when we pull both the wires, the device is now permanently released onto the valve leaflet, which is what you see here. This is partially released. And then in a second, you will see it fully released. And what you see now, this is the final result, is that 
you have this nice airbag or boxing glove type of uh, implant at the leading edge of the leaflet, which the leaflet brings into coaptation and corrects its FMR. As simple as that. There's no diastolic restriction to the flow in any manner. And we don't see really change in the gradients. So we have done extensive bench work trying to demonstrate that we can actually use this technology to correct FMR of various etiologies. We have tested it in ischemic type of type 3B FMR where the regurgitation is commissural. And what we have shown is that we can actually correct the MR really well. We have done the same in dilated or central FMR. We have shown uh, very good outcomes. But we have also done this in atrial FMR where you have chronic atrial fibrillation with a very wide gap. We enhanced with three devices, the entire posterior leaflet. And what we have seen is that we can completely correct the regurgitation in these uh, variety of anatomies. The more important part is we are doing that without changing the gradients. So here is a graph. We put a millar across the valve to measure the gradients. And what we show is this is with FMR before any repair. As we put Carlin or cardiac leaflet enhancer devices to correct FMR, we don't change anything. Whereas as we clip these leaflets, we start to see a very large increase in the gradients over time, which is visually very easy to understand why that is the case. The last part is with a mitre clip and uh, The last part here is with a mitre clip where you have clipped the leaflets permanently versus this, which is a dynamic augmentation implant. The next thing we have done is gone into animals. We introduced heart failure in these animals by introducing a myocardial infarction, let the animals go to three months, develop FMR, and then we came in with the device to uh, test if we can correct the FMR. This is a representative echocardiogram before and after where you can see the, how the leaflet enhancement can actually help in improving the regurgitation quite a bit. And we did this in a couple of pigs and we were able to show in this disease model that we can get the regurgitation down significantly without altering the diastolic gradients. This is histopathology of the implant at about six months after it has been implanted. And what we see is very nice integration of the implant into the tissue. So the entire implant gets covered with tissue and what you're left now with this, with this nice bump at the ed leading edge of the leaflet and nothing more. And there's tissue infiltration that occurs through the entire uh, implant. And we also don't tear or modify any of the opposing leaflet that is co-opting onto this device because we are only enhancing the free edge of the co-optation and nothing more. So where are we today with this? Uh, we built this technology out with an IH funding, spun it out, raised $20 million, and now we are actually six uh, months away from doing our first in human implant in uh, patients. And we are currently working on the regulatory approval to actually get there. We are working through the uh, patient selection for our early feasibility study. And uh, our plan currently is to recruit about 20 patients in the next uh, two years to be able to get there. Now, getting to the last part of the story uh, with the time that I have, which is even if we succeed, we will be targeting these patients. Small ventricles, FMR, we do well. What about these patients? Large ventricles, FMR, they don't have any therapy. Even if you go clip, put Carlin, whatever else, they're just not going to benefit that much because you're only removing one stressor that causes LV remodeling, not both of them. So we started working on a different device. Uh, this is with, uh, again, with Daisuke Onohara and Chase King, who is another general surgery resident in the laboratory. We thought, well, what are the two stresses? FMR, shape of the ventricle. <clears throat> if we make a device that can actually reshape the ventricle and reduce the ventricular volumes, do we get a benefit? Actually, we do. Historically, that has been shown to uh, work quite well. The coapsis device, the myocore device, all these devices that try to reduce the ventricular volume actually had good results, but they just didn't survive. So what did we do? We just modified it slightly differently and basically said we can come up with an approach where we can not only reduce, F not only reduce the ventricle, but if we do it the right way, we can even eliminate MR without having to clip or place a carlin in these very large ventricles. How do we do that? Well, in 2014, we published a paper in Jack where we showed that the one of the primary causes of FMR 
is not because the ventricle is dilated, the papillary muscles are pulled out, but it's more that there is this interpapillary muscle dynamics which are lost in patients, meaning from diastole to systole, this is what papillary muscles do in a normal patient. But in a failing ventricle, this is what they do. So when the papillary muscles are separated out laterally in systole, the cords are pulling down the leaflet edges and stiffening them so they don't actually coapt. So we have done this surgically in a lot of pigs that if you approximate these papillary muscles together, you can actually eliminate FMR without doing anything else in these patients. So we built on that concept and built it further. So what we have done is we have developed a beating heart device where we can go through the papillary muscles into the myocardium and then bring both the papillary muscles together, but also reduce the sphericity of the myocardium together uh, of the left ventricular uh, chamber as well. So we tried a bunch of things. The first thing we have done is in, a, in one example that I'm showing here, we place these uh, tensioning uh, members through the papillaries into the myocardium just at the level of the papillaries. This is pre, again, in a pig model where we have induced a myocardial infarction and let the pigs develop heart failure and FMR. <clears throat> this is post, where you actually see that the ventricle, which was spherical, is now reduced, and the FMR is reduced quite a bit as well, even though there's a certain amount of uh, uh, FMR still left. This is the second approach that we have taken, which is, well, before I get there, this is how the short axis ventricles look like. This is pre, where you see the nice infarction, you see the di uh, dyssynchrony in the myocardial contraction, and this is post, where we have actually placed that implant, which you can see here, excluded the infarction, reduced the volume, and you actually start to see that these ventricular uh, different segments start to contract together quite well. We did this in some pigs. Then we moved on and tried to do something else in these pigs, which is if we are just laterally reducing the ventricle, which is great, but the fibers of the myocardium are actually this way. They are not radially. So if we go in and put these anchors along the fiber direction and reduce them, can we actually get a much better myofiber stress relieving effect? We tried that in a, uh, in a pig. So this is another pig with uh, myocardial infarction developing FMR. It was an okay result. We reduced the FMR, but we really weren't able to reduce the ventricle as much, which is expected because radially it's easy to pull together. Whereas when we go this way, you really can't get the ventricle uh, to reduce as much. In the last configuration, what we have done is we have done two implants, one closer to the mitral annulus, one closer to the papillary muscles, and this seems to have worked beautifully in, uh, in the pigs. So here you see a pig prior to correction, and here you see a pig post-correction where we have placed two implants in a beating heart approach. So what does this do? It does a couple of things. So I'm showing data from the last group, which is the two uh, implants. Firstly, we get a good reduction of EDV before repair versus after placing the splints. We reduce the sphericity. So I'm pretty sure we are reducing the wall stresses. We are also reducing the interpapillary muscle distance, which is great because that eliminates FMR. All different parameters that indicate good function of the mitral valve are starting to show. We increase the coaptation length. We reduce the tenting area. We increase the excursion angle of the posterior leaflet, which means that we are mobilizing the leaflets quite well in these highly tethered valves. What is happening at the myocardial level? This is pressure volume loops averaged over five pigs that I'm showing, where you actually see that the pressure volume loops start to become smaller and have a leftward shift when we, uh, when we do this papillary uh, or LB reshaping with papillary approximation implant in these pigs. We see the ESPBR starting to go up, but there is high variability. We also see that the max DPDT max normalized to the EDV, preload adjusted DPDT max is starting to go up, potentially indicating better function. Our stroke work is going down. Our pressure volume area is going down, indicating that the myocardial oxygen consumption may be reduced as well. We do not see any diastolic restriction when we are doing this, which is also important. So 
by targeting this ventricular stress in including reducing fmr we may be doing something beneficial to the myocardium which is not entirely leaned out from a uh, you know myocardial biological remodeling etc but there are indices from a hemodynamic standpoint which seem to be indicating that uh, we are going in the right direction this is early stages of technology development we are not there yet with this but the chronic effects of this device on LV mechanics and remodeling is currently going on. We have a group of pigs now where we have done this, and then we are doing serial MRIs on these uh, animals so that we can actually assess what's happening to the myocardial uh, mechanics and function. And lastly, this is work in progress. This is transepical, meaning no cardiologist will pick it up. So we have to convert this into transfemoral, and that is work that we are uh, currently working on which is to go, go either transaortic or transeptal in trying to get to the ventricle and do this reshaping approaches. So with that, I'll stop and uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. Sir, I'm uh, fascinating that uh, we've, uh, the, these new technologies, I, I, I interviewed somebody at the uh, CRT meeting in Washington recently he was talking about one other direction for uh, heart failure and that was not only uh, changing the uh, circumferential or the uh, shape of the, of the left ventricle but the longitudinal and had a device that was uh, actually shortening mm -hmm. consistently shortening the by, by putting something at the mitral mm -hmm. angle yeah. and something at the apex is, is that a I mean is that that technique uh, seems to me by itself might aggravate the the uh, what you're trying to accomplish here, uh, but that's uh, just just an observation I had. What what do you uh, you, you talked about uh, first in man for this uh, uh, device you've got for the uh, uh, thickening the valve? Uh, you you able to get a uh, Early feasibility, U.S. early feasibility approval for that, so yes. you don't have to go some other country or something. We are pursuing both OUS and EFS in parallel. FDA has changed over the years that they are very, very open to early feasibility trials of new technologies, much more than OUS. It is still a very systematic approach, but despite the systematic approach, I think the appetite for risk is a lot more with the FDA today. But it just comes down to regulatory bodies approving is one thing, sites being able to recruit patients is another thing. So we are still working through that. But to answer your question, I think uh, EFS is a pathway that we will probably choose over OUS. And just to answer your other question about the longitudinal, I've looked at that device. My thought is that the longitudinal contraction or expansion is a result of this radial fibers that how they're oriented in the normal heart. Putting a device that just does that, I don't feel too comfortable. It may just do the opposite of what uh, we want to achieve with ventricular remodeling, I think. Uh, Stan Sherman. Uh, can you tell me uh, on this thickening device that you have, do you, it, it was very, uh, it wasn't very long. Do you see maybe needing two of those devices in some patients with their mitral GERD? Absolutely. I think there's a certain amount of uh, pre-procedural planning that needs to be done, which is what you already do today is that you're going to look at color Doppler imaging to actually look at your uh, regurgitant gap width. You're going to look at where the location of the regurgitation is. And once you look at that, we have devices of multiple widths. So if one device fits very well with that uh, regurgitant gap width, then you are okay. But if you need multiple ones that need to be put one beside the other, then yes, you pretty much can do that. And we have done that in PICS with eight, uh, where we have completely gone from one commissure to the other and stacked up devices and created a brand new leaflet. So- Hello, it's Peter Block. May I ask a quick question? Go ahead, Peter. Yep. Uh, so 
a, a couple of questions. Number one, how do you attach the device? I, I may have missed that, <clears throat> but it sounds like you just place it on top somehow in that transeptal uh, device that you have on a anterior posterior leaflet, number one. And number two, the whole concept of spacers uh, has been around for a long time, as I'm sure you know, particularly on the other side, on the tricuspid side, uh, where they seem to work acutely, but then long-term didn't do so well. And then the whole business of what happens to the surface and thromboembolic phenomena and so forth. Can you comment on both of those questions? Absolutely. So number one, how are we attaching it? This is a clip-like device with a bump. So think about this of, as half a mitre clip for your clinical workflow, meaning we have two grasping arms that actually grasp onto the leaflet, and there is a bump on top of this. So we are grasping with a nitinol frame onto the valve leaflet. In terms of your second thing about spacers, I absolutely agree with you, but we have to look at how is the spacer technology implemented in previous designs. Most of those designs anchored a balloon into the ventricle, brought that balloon up across the valve and had it dangling in between the leaflets. So one of the reasons, because I've implanted one of those devices in pigs, one of the things that I've seen is that when you try to do that, your leaflets are really trying to push your spacer or balloon-like device in, uh, based on the forces that the leaflets impose on it. And that often tends to just disturb the mitral regurgitant flow in a variety of ways rather than stop the regurgitation entirely. The second thing is that the risk of this long device pulling out of the ventricle has occurred in a variety of uh, human situations as well. What we are trying to do is, if you had a valve leaflet that was thicker, that had a bump at the edge, just the leading edge, not the rough zone of the leaflet, not the entire leaflet, and you made that bump large, what I mean by that is, you made that bump such that if you had a regurgitant gap of four millimeters, I put in a one centimeter uh, wide uh, device in there. I'm correcting regurgitation initially, but I'm also providing you future insurance for continued LV remodeling because I have oversized the implant now. Those are the concepts based on which I think this technology might work compared to how spacers were previously uh, implemented in these patients. I've always thought that uh, calling the mitral clip an edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, was a little bit of a misnomer. And in functional MR, uh, no wonder it doesn't work because it, the rest of the valve is left edge-to-edge. -edge. And what you need is the shelf, as you call it, or coaptation zone. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you ask a cardiac fellow to draw you a picture of the aortic valve, they'll draw the picture like this. They won't draw it like that. And uh, when I draw it like that, I like to put little arrows on each side because the pressure on each side mm -hmm. closes that coaptation zone, makes it tight. So um, anyway, thanks so much for that. You, when, when you, uh, the device is actually creating a larger coaptation, it's creating coaptation, number one, it's creating, creating a larger coaptation zone. It is. Yep. Thanks so much. Great. And then we'll end with our last question there in the text, uh, in the chat box there um, by Dr. Dolmatova. She would like for you to comment on, uh, looks like the ventricular strain. It's a very good question. That's why we are doing tagged MRI in these pigs that we are longitudinally following to understand how ventricular strain might change. But I wouldn't address ventricular strain as one entity. It depends on where you're looking. In the, our expectation based on data that I haven't presented yet and what we potentially will be seeing based on the data I have seen is that the remote zone strain is going to get normalized because you are enabling remote zone reverse remodeling by reducing oh. the wall stresses there right beside the pads where we put those pads, the strains are going to be slightly unphysiological because the pads are pushing it in. When it comes to the 
infarcted region. We are actually reducing the strain on the infarcted region because we are pulling this thing together and excluding it from the cavity. So it is doing what Dor and Batista have done a long time ago and have actually shown to work. It just was done in an open heart situation, which was not the easiest to do. But I think strain will get better in specific regions, but not as much in specific regions. How does that impact overall ventricular function and twist? We do not know yet. We are working on that. But let me give you an example there. I have seen a group of patients in India where there are no LVADs where patients do this uh, overcoat technique, where they go in, remove the entire uh, uh, infarct region, put an overcoat like suture on top of them, making it very oblique and reducing the sphericity. Those patients who came with end-stage heart failure currently are surviving beyond 10 years and doing just well without a very expensive LVAD, but with somewhat of a wall stress-like approach that uh, we are taking. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.